Good evening. I'm very happy to um, welcome you to the Marblehead Museum and Historical Society. Uh, this is <clears throat> the second to last in our uh, Marblehead 101 series for this spring, which has been so well attended, and I think people have really been uh, enjoying it, and that's wonderful. Um, the last lecture will be uh, on May 19th. Uh, Karen McGinnis, our curator, will be talking about uh, the uh, Marblehead samplers, and that is um, we are very fortunate to have an outstanding collection, so she'll be talking about them. But um, it gives me great pleasure to be able to uh, introduce Stanley Goodwin. I've, we've gotten to know Stanley in the last several years, and I have great respect for his abilities as an historian, um, uh, which is a, sort of a, an advocation since he is a, um, a very um, distinguished scientist as well. Uh, but his Insight, his, uh, his interest in detail, um, and his meticulous research is really outstanding. Uh, and so this is the second lecture that he's done for us, and um, this is about what happened in Marblehead in the 1600s. And I think that um, it's, uh, there are some, some interesting things that we, that we maybe haven't thought about. Uh, and so it's a, my great pleasure to introduce Stanley, and thank you for being here. Marblehead in the 1600s. Uh, the one thing that you need to start out with is what was going on in the 1600s. The actual settlement of the whole area happened very, very rapidly. In the spring of 1609, 1629, there were about a total of 450 inhabitants in the entire what later became Colony of Massachusetts Bay. About 200 of them at Plymouth, uh, probably 75 in Salem, 100 plus in Boston, and the rest of them scattered around in small settlements. In the summer of, now in England, they had formed the Massachusetts Bay Company in 1628, and it was the first uh, colonization that was set up for profit and for the long haul. All the previous uh, investment groups came in, tried for a couple of years, didn't make any money, backed out, and left the people here. That happened to Plymouth, happened to every single one of them. There were three or four of them that all had the same thing happen to. These people were a bunch of very well-to-do people who were in it for a number of years. So in the spring of 16, in the summer of 1629, they sent an advance group, what I would call an advance group, of about 290 immigrants with 200 men and 90 women and children. They went to Salem and almost most of them stayed in Salem. A few went to Charlestown. And this was their first group and they brought them with supplies. Now when you're an immigrant, Coming here, uh, the one thing you've got here is lots of fish. What you don't have is grain, produce, and it's going to take you a year and a quarter from the time you set foot on land until you're self-sufficient and you've got your first crop in. And in that period of time, you've got to live off of the supplies that that boat brought. And once that boat was left, you're pretty much on your own. And this place was about as close to a wilderness as you can get. In 1630, the, what was called the Winthrop Fleet came in. This was about a thousand immigrants <coughs> came in and came to Salem. And they, most of them ended up in Charlestown because Salem was not really a good site for a major uh, center, major city because everything was done by war. All, all real uh, communication and transport was done by water. The Salem just didn't have enough river systems or uh, water. So Boston had the whole harbor which you could use. They settled Dorchester, Charlestown, uh, Cambridge, and a whole bunch of places all around there they could access by water, either by river or by the harbor. Now, 
This left them with increasing, in 1629, they almost doubled the population. In 1630, they more than doubled the population. And now all these people are living off supplies, loaded on the boat, hopefully the right ones. A lot of cases, they didn't quite get all the right things. So for the people who got here, who didn't really understand, they'd been living in England in a finished community. Here they were suddenly in the wilderness, having to deal with all those problems. That first year and a quarter was a tough thing. Uh, for most of them, the margin of survival was pretty thin until they got that first harvest. And the reality is, about 10% of them didn't make it. But this, compared to the horror show of Plymouth, this really isn't very bad. They lost 50% of the people. Now, you have to, the background of what everything's going here, every single year until 1641, another 1,000 to 2,000 immigrants arrived. This is just going on and on and on. It does not stop. So the big thing is feeding all of these people and getting them used, getting them ready to live here. And it's a non-stop thing that goes on for 12 years. The reason for this immigration was religious. In England, there were a group of people called the Puritans who were trying to reform the Anglican Church. And the Anglican Church at that time was very close to uh, the Catholic Church with uh, the bishops in England controlling it instead of the Pope. These people wanted a Calvinist type church. And the king, who was Charles I, wanted a common religion throughout the English realm. And these people didn't. So pretty quickly, they started to get, uh, they called it persecution. It was severe annoyance in the beginning. But this was less than 100 years after Henry VIII. So all of them knew what it could develop into. And there were a lot of them who wanted to get out. They were mostly all middle class people. The, when, when Loud got to be the Archbishop of Canterbury, things started to get more unpleasant and more of them wanted out. So the, that's what prompted this uh, migration. In some places you'll hear it called the Great Migration. Now the people you're getting are the extremists, basically. The people on the edge who are most likely to end up uh, in the sights of the church hierarchy. You're not getting the average person. You're getting the fellow right on the edge of uh, the extremes. And they were, they were mostly middle class. Uh, a lot of them had a moderate education. They had, uh, they were a lot of tradesmen and not a fair number of farmers. There's no indication there's a lot of fishing amongst them. Now, I'm quoting numbers here. One of the problems you run into in this period is numbers vary pretty, from whoever you read, the numbers of people vary in a lot of cases by almost a factor of two between the low estimate, I've read cases, sometimes the same story from four different authors, and gotten numbers of people that were a factor of two different between the highest and lowest. I picked, in my case, the number that I think makes the most sense and for the middle, kind of middle range number. But between 1630 and 1641, 15,000 people came to Massachusetts when there was virtually nothing in 1630. And in 1641, there was a full up and going society, pretty mature. It, it's really an amazing thing that really between 1629 and 1635, 
they managed to transport a whole society 3,000 miles into a wilderness and get it totally self-sufficient and operating. And it's something that I doubt has been done very often in the, in the history of the world. Now, in 1641, the English Civil War started, which was basically the parliament against the king. And at that point, the immigration pretty well stopped on the religious ones. The uh, people reverted to what I call the economic model, which is the immigrants came here to get a better life. <coughs> Now, now, as far as Marblehead is concerned, from the time it was started until 1649, it was prior to Salem. There were no public records kept in Marblehead. There was no organization at all in Marblehead. Your information comes either from public records that you are in Salem or a few personal papers that survive, and there aren't many. I believe there's some of Moses Maverick's papers that survive, but there just aren't very many personal papers. So you basically go on the public records for deeds and wills and uh, the uh, quarterly courts and things of that sort. The local events in Marblehead that didn't get to Salem didn't get recorded. So you get little gaps. And you'll find in various books, people more or less use the gaps and what little information they got to put their own interpretation on. Here's one of the, here's the earliest uh, reference to a place called Marble Head. Now, whether it's really Marblehead or not, I have no idea. It could be, and it might not be. But this was written in 1629 by a Reverend Higginson, who was writing about building materials. And he had down at the bottom mentions uh, that there was an island that had slate, and then he had a place that had marble, and he calls it Marble had and it had a harbor nearby. Now this was buried in Harvard Library in a do not circulate document. So whoever found this inevitably highlighted it in their book because they probably spent a month at least finding it. <laughs> uh, the next one, which definitely uh, talks about Marble Head, and it's called in this case Marville Head. It lies four miles from Salem. Convenient place for plantation, especially for such as will set upon the trade of fishing. There was made here a ship's load of fish the last year, where still stands the flakes and drying scaffolds. Here be good harbor for boats and safe riding for ships. What it doesn't say is whether this is a year-round community or just a summer community which will come up and no one, no one really at this point really knows that answer. <laughs> Initially, Marblehead was really in two parts. The harbor side, which we know very little about, was probably <clears throat> settled first. I mean, it's, it has a gorgeous summer harbor for anyone who's in a commercial fishing operation. The English were known to send ships over here fishing ships for the summer and base them typically on shore. Initially, the fishermen came over, would fill the hole up and they have to turn around and go back. Traveling 6,000 miles for one <laughs> hole full of fish isn't the most efficient way to go. So soon they started putting people ashore and uh, having them process the first load of fish while they went out and caught a second load. And then they uh, put them in barrels and uh, go ahead. And then it developed into processing operations. Now, no one knows for sure until 1631 whether Marble had, in fact, 
was doing this. In the 1620s, we flat out don't know. There's no information before 1631. So we don't have any records. It's fairly likely it happened, but there's no records to say one way or another. And that was just in the summertime operation. Now the Salem side was an extension of Salem. And here's a, probably a misconception of Marblehead. Marblehead on the Salem side had some very good farmland. And also between the Glover School and Benin Square, and there's a spur of it that goes right down to the new high school. There was some very good farmland. It was farmed actively into the 1920s as a market garden of, out of Boston. So Marblehead was not a place you couldn't grow things. And for the people in Salem, it was a lot better uh, farmland than they had. So here's, here's a rough side uh, cut of the be some of the best land, which happens to be uh, Darby Fort is where Naugus Head is now. And on either side of that, there's some very good farmland. And that's where the Salem people tended to go and use that for farmland. And it was a quick trip across. Salem Harbor, and since all the communication was done by water anyway, it didn't really make any difference. Uh, the first settlers. Well, the first recorded events, there's two of them in 1631. We've got Thomas Gray, who was in Marblehead, and no one has said what he was convicted of. But they ordered his house to be torn down, and he was to be shunned, not spoken to by anybody. Uh, now, this sounds like a terrible punishment. However, he was in Marblehead probably with, at most, one or two other families. As long as he didn't go to Salem, nobody was going to bother him. The house he was living in was probably little more than a two-room uh, hut, which could easily be moved, or he could build another one. All he had to do was get out of sight of everybody, which he apparently did, because he pops up in the 1637 taxpayers list, and he got a cow in the pasture division of 1648. So obviously, uh, for all of the, uh, <coughs> whatever he did, didn't, lack, didn't get remembered very long. The fellow died of old age in Marblehead and received the first public <laughs> assistance to, from the town. He got a suit of clothes. <laughs> Now, he's probably the best candidate as the first permanent resident. Uh, the reason he was from the, Anasqu the Cape Ann colony, the, the 25, the out of the 25 people that came from Cape Ann to Salem and founded Salem, he was one of that group. And there were 14 families, <coughs> and when the in 1628, under Endicott, a group of about 50 people came to Salem. And they had a new charter, and they proceeded to act like they owned the place. And the people who uh, were there were not real happy with, the, with somebody walking in and taking over and then trying to steal their food and, put, and what and houses. Uh, so it's not unlikely that two or three families decided that, they, that in the spring of 1629, they were going to get out of Salem. They probably had to fill up these people that had just come in and were making pain in the neck out of themselves. <laughs> but we, we don't know for sure. And there's no way to ever say, with the fluidity of people moving around at that time, who else besides him ever came over. But he's certainly your first candidate. The other candidates that we've had the standard stories about, like John Peach. John Peach didn't come here until 1630, so he clearly wasn't here in 1628 when that story was in. He came in the Winthrop Fleet in 1630. And the Dollabers, which the other stories about, the ones we know of, came here in the mid-1630s. So I can't answer. The, the Dollarman may have lived in a hogshead, but he didn't do it in 1628 because he wasn't here. Now, the other event, which is kind of a big event, Isaac Allerton from the Puritan colony at Plymouth. Uh, 
came on a fishing boat, the White Angel, to set up a fishing operation for Matthew Craddock. Now, Matthew Craddock was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And he was a big operator in England who had interests all over the world. He never came here, but he was given, regardless, as a part of his investment, he was given land here. And as his agent, Isaac Allican set up an operation. Now we now know from the maps, now this is the story, Little Harbor was the center. However, in reality, what he was really doing is he was using Gas House Beach as the center of the operation. And there was a straightforward reason. If you look at Marblehead, the only landing spot you've got without a dock that leads to, quickly leads you to hard land that you can get a road across is Gas House Beach and that little road off of it. You're very quickly onto what's now Orange Street. And you had to do that because when one of those ships, if you were bringing in English ships, they were literally unloading tons of fish. We weren't talking about carrying it in baskets. You needed an ox cart at least. You'd run the ship in there at high tide, round it out, wait for the tide to go out and start loading the fish and head, take, take the ox cart off to the uh, nearest place to start processing and drying it. So that that's, was the sign of the odds are that they moored the larger ships in what was called the Big Harbor, which we now call the Harbor. Seriously doubt, given the size of Little Harbor, it hasn't gotten any uh, bigger since then. It's just not big enough for the size ships that they were dealing with on the commercial ones. They may, there probably was a small operation there. By 1633, he was employing eight boats and five men on the foot. That probably means there are eight, most likely eight boats from England and five men who were ashore who were doing the processing. Uh, in the fall of 33, he and his fishermen were sleeping at Craddock's house when it caught fire. They all had thatched roofs. And the interesting thing is that a tailor was here. Now, one does not expect the tailor when there's that few people. Apparently, there was a fair amount of business going on in the harbor then. They had a tailor, he roused them, and they all survived. But I found it interesting that there was a tailor here at that early a time. In 1635, Mr. Allerton got warned out, which meant he was to leave the colony. And it appears that he, the problem was, he had been associating with liberal churchmen. And he probably got caught up in one of what I call the Roger, William, the Roger Williams affair, which was a, was a big deal in Salem and got Roger, then went off and founded uh, Rhode Island. Uh, his, he, transferred all of his holdings to his 24-year-old son, Moses, son-in-law, Moses Maverick. Moses had married uh, Allerton's daughter, remember. For some reason, the uh, pilgrims liked to name their children for virtues and vices. Remember, fear, there were a whole bunch of these odd names that they used. Now, Moses went on to be a very successful businessman I would call him the unofficial town magistrate. Because he was the select man. He held just about every office there was in town at one point or another. And he was the only justice of the peace. And since Marblehead didn't have an ordained church, he did all the marriages in Marblehead until there was an ordained church. You either used, went to Isaac or you went to Salem. Those were your choices. Now, here's the harbor side. Now, right in here, item 32, that's Craddock's land. Right above it is <coughs> Maverick's land. This happens to be about 1650. But this is what confirms exactly where we, uh, where the fishing operation of Little Harbor was. It's unlikely they were, if the, with the bigger ships, that they were actually mooring them there, but they were unloading them there. 
and plus all the wharves and whatever that went with it, all, all the building that went with the fishing operation was centered around that area. Now, as far as permanent settled arrival, settlement of Marble Head, I personally would pick 1629, but certainly 1630. There were permanent settles here who were year, here year round. There wasn't very much growth until 1633 or maybe 1634. There were a couple of people who got sentenced for drunkenness in 1633. By the way, that's a very interesting thing. To, everybody over here drank <clears throat> alcohol to bed. That was the standard part of life. However, if you got drunk, the Puritans had five levels of drunkenness that they could sentence you for. <laughs> They, they took a very, very dim view of <laughs> drunkenness. And in 1635, to annoy Salem, since this is part of the Roger Williams affair, they said that there should be a plantation at Marble Head. Well, Marble Head didn't have a lot, it probably had no more than 20 families in it at that, at that time. And also, <coughs> The other interesting thing in 35 is a Mr. Holgrave compressed men to unload salt from the ship. If there's 20 families here, what in the world are you going to do with a full ship of salt? There's probably no more than 10 or 15 of them who'd be fishing. And we're talking about a shipload of salt. The odds are this was to supply ships that were coming from England. It's the only rational explanation for anything that much. And in 1636, they built a ship here of 120 tons. They call it a desire, I've heard it called Desiree. I can't really give you the correct pronunciation. It was about 120 tons, and since she went fishing for the first two years, I'm assuming she was built on the pattern of the standard English fishing boat of the time. We've got no pictures or no representations of what boats looked like in the 1600s. So we can't, I'd love to show you a picture, don't have one. And in 1637, Marblehead was important enough for Salem to start a ferry. So this got communication to the Dar Darby Fort and into the farmland so that they could keep supporting all of those immigrants that kept pouring into this country. Now, 1637, we got a list of 24 taxpayers. And it's more interesting by who's not here than who is here. A lot of them you recognize. One of the things you don't see is a dollar, which is rather interesting in that I would have expected to see a dollar <coughs> on this list. And you don't see John Peach Jr., who I know was here at the time, but you get an idea. Anthony Thatcher, who's Thatcher's Island, there's a whole story that goes with that, but outside of the scope of what we've got here. The, the, these are the people that were listed, one of the few lists we've got, early times, that uh, give us an idea of who was here and who wasn't here. And we have our friend Thomas Gray, who got in trouble in 1631, yet they sure taxed him in 1637. <laughs> the Puritans. Now, the Puritans, the king here, were really kind of the extreme people. And they formed a very strict Calvinist type church. And they really didn't like any dissent. And in the way they set it up, the government was an arm of the church. In England, it was the other way that were around. The church was an arm of the government. So the government did pretty well what the church wanted. Salem. Marblehead was a part of Salem, but it was really never under their control. They just, it was here, it was just too far away to do anything significant about the place. So as people found they didn't get along with the Puritan church, they were a number of them that settled over here. These are the poor souls caught in the middle. They were too extreme for the Calvinists, for the Anglican Church, but they weren't extreme enough for the Puritans, so they were caught. And 
Salem didn't much enjoy Marblehead because something, every time something happened in Marblehead that the great general court in Boston didn't like, they blamed Salem for it. <laughs> in 1638, William Walton appeared in Marblehead and he became the minister. Now about half the town taxes paid itself, so obviously these people weren't totally irreligious. But they're paying, and they all got to vote on this too. They're paying half of their taxes to support the minister's salary. And we know that a small room meeting house was built somewhere in the area of 16, somewhere between when he got here in 1648 when the town really got organized. Um, we don't know, no one knows when. You'll get references, both dates, depending on who you read. The, the population wasn't irreligious. They just weren't pre-urban religious. Now, as far as economy, every individual in town had to be nearly self-sufficient in probably the first 10 years. The problem is that every single major settlement was on the coast. Boston, Marblehead, Ipswich, Newburyport, every single one of them, with the exception of Marblehead, sat at the head of a river system, had a harbor, and was on the coast. And it took a long time for them to move significant numbers of people inland. So if you, what you needed, fish was easy to come by. Unfortunately, everybody was, Salem had a fishing operation, Boston had a fishing operation, Ipswich had a fishing operation, so the odds of you trading fish with them wasn't very good. So if you just had a fishing economy, you weren't going to have any grain, you weren't going to have any produce, or you were going to send your fish over to England and wait six months for something to come back. So the answer very simply was, you had to have a pretty well-rounded community. So I'd have to say that fishing at the beginning was overrated. It's a lot of authors have said it was a fishing village from the beginning. It couldn't have survived as a fishing village from the beginning on its own. Uh, by 1640, Marblehead was big enough to be a town. There's little question of that. It had nearly 40 families that we know of. And at that point, Salem transferred the unassigned land to the inhabitants of Marblehead, which was a cause of a real controversy about 30 years later. The big problem was the people who could vote were called freemen. They, number one, had to be a member of the Puritan church. Number two, they had to be substantial loan or landowners. And there were other conditions, but it basically meant that virtually nobody in Marblehead, with the exception of Moses Brown, were qualified. So there weren't any voters here. So with no voters, they couldn't really form a town because there was nobody to uh, run the organization. In 1649, the Great General <coughs> Court created what I call a second level of franchise. And this was obviously known before it actually was passed. <coughs> Every male over 24 who'd taken the oath of fidelity could then vote for selectmen and serve on jurors. So he got kind of halfway vote. If you were a freeman, you got to elect the governor and the, uh, the general government, participate in the government of the entire colony. But, a, but a, well, let me step ahead. Marblehead. Salem passed an order in March of 1648 that Marble had become a town. I assume it was known that they were going to set up this uh, second level of franchise at the time. So in 1649, the Great and General Court allowed uh, the town to be incorporated and also passed the second level of franchise, which probably were somewhat tied together, although other towns used it. And the inhabitants knew it was coming, so in 1648 they got ready. They had seven selectmen. Now there's about 42 families in town, so 
just about everybody seems to have got a job. They had uh, seven selectmen, uh, a couple of tax collectors, and they had one other official that was on the roll. But also, interestingly, they put a tax on strangers. Strangers were people who people didn't live in the town. This covered people from Salem, people from fishing boats off of England, any, anybody who wasn't a resident of town. And this kind of confirms that we had English fishing boats coming over here. It is known that the English sent boats over here into the 1700s, that they, summered, they spent their summers here into the, into the early 1700s and went back in the fall. Uh, the other thing of importance is the 44 recorded families uh, divided up a large chunk of land for pasture for 50 cows. And this is your list of residents and pretty well all the people you've heard of of importance from Marblehead are on this list. Now you've got the Dollivers here, the Peaches here, the uh, Devros, Gatchel, they're all, they're just about all of them are really here. Chin, the, the Chine, George Chine in the bottom here was actually Chin in later, later days. This is something that I'll post on the web for those who want to look at it. This is the, one of the few lists we've got of people who are in the town. Now this is a picture of that pastor. You will notice kind of a dark line down the middle. This part was called the lower division. This was called the middle division or smallpox pasture. That line is roughly where Peach Highlands is right now. Peach Highlands Road is right now. It was a wall and it was in strips of land that went all the way from Pond Street. And Pond Street went down alongside Red's Pond all the way to Beacon Street. The strips were anywhere from 300 foot wide to 60 foot wide. Initially, it was really just for apportioning the array of you own something, but really they apportioned the rent for people who had cows on the pasture. Later on, it became very important in the late 1800 when they started to develop the land. The, the boundaries had significance then. Previously, early days, they didn't. Now, just kind of as a break from all of this kind of dry stuff, there's a thing called Tilting Rock, which many people may have heard of. It was a rock, large rock, that was perfectly balanced. And children in colonial times would run from one end to the other, and the rock would tilt back and forth. Now, that rock still exists. It is, if you drive from Green Street down on Beacon Street towards uh, Bradley Road or towards the harbor, as you make a sharp turn about 150 yards from uh, Bradley Road, you see a fence with a hole in it and a half of a great big rock sticking out. That is Tilting Rock. It's been uh, changed so it doesn't tilt anymore, but it's kind of... <laughs> Obviously, with liabilities now, they wouldn't allow a rock. The, you know, the thing is literally this wide. It's a big rock. And this is about what marble, this is Sidney Pearlie's <coughs> reconstruction of marble head in 1649. It shows you a lot of farmland, uh, the big chunks to the left of the harbor are all farmland. And the, the uh, area on the strips on Salem Harbor are also farmland. The middle area was mostly pasture land. There isn't a lot of landowners on the harbor side at that point. Now, Marblehead, after it incorporated, grew slowly and steadily. Remember, I mean, the, all these immigrants stopped in 1641. So immigrants were coming in slowly. Everybody finally had a time to 
get things to settle down and stabilize. The things that, kind of the events that happened, is the meeting house. Now, you, you've seen pictures of the meeting house, and the meeting house that actually was there doesn't appear to be anything like the descriptions. They just kept, every time the town expanded, they put another addition on. And they had three or four different additions before they finally ran out. They put in a lot of uh, regulations for fish processing. Now, they had uh, packers and gaugers, a couple of men knew that, colors of fish. They were making sure that fish processed in Marble Head was good fish for the European market. And they also required that the uh, barrels the fish were packed in be marked with the master of the boat. Now, for the Englishman who handed over his fish to be processed, he darn well wanted to get back the fish he handed over, not somebody else's leavings. So, I suspect that was probably the real reason for this one. It's pretty clear Marble Head were processing in the summertime an awful lot of fish. Now, the number of people here just can't explain the amount of fish they appear to be processing. So, likely, as I say, this pretty well argues that the main source of large quantities of fish are these commercial English boats. Although there certainly was a local uh, operation going on. And by 1660, we had about 60 families in the town. And in 1662, we get a glimpse into what's kind of the, the unknown world. There were 13 men in four boats lost in a storm. You know this because Moses Maverick had to settle the estate of six of them. One thing, you may not make any other record, but if you died, they were going to probate your estate to make sure that the debt of you, anybody you owed money to got paid. So that uh, probate is the only record of these people. So the assumption here I've got here is that these are poor fishermen who were taking a big chance and went out overnight in small boats. There were three to four men in a boat, and they were probably in a 30 to 40 foot range. They were caught in the storm, and they were all lost. And out of probably no more than 80 or 90 adult males in the town, 13 of them were lost. The surprising thing is you don't find it anywhere else but in these probate records. Fishing has obviously become a lot more important part of the economy than it started out being. Now you had communities had now moved inland uh, away from the coast. They'd gone up the various river systems, and you had Concord, and Lexington, and you had uh, Andover, various communities that all moved, moved inland. Uh, now we come to the controversy. In 1674, the, uh, what had happened when Salem handed the land over to Marble Head, they handed it over to the inhabitants. Now, the inhabitants at the time made an agreement as to who owned what portion of the land. And they called themselves the commoners. Now, the people who came later on uh, thought they should have a piece of the pie. So the argument got so bad, they had to go to the general court to get a settlement. And out of this settlement, from my point of view, I got 114 names of people who at least uh, made the records and were in the town. And Sidney Purley did us the favor of going through and uh, giving us the occupation of about 89 families. Now, some of these people had in various documents. Typically, when you did a deed, you say, John Smith planter or John Smith fisherman, 
That was typical. They do list the occupation in the, after the name in the document. So as a result, you could t get an idea. Fishing was obviously the number one. Uh, farming and land owning was pretty clearly number two. So farming was still important. I suspect landowner also meant, in so many cases, farmer. Then you got some merchants, mariners, and just about all the mariners at some point were also listed as fishermen. And after that, investors and a few of the people you'd expect to see. A uh, couple of millers, which shows you that we were grinding grain in town. We always had a grist mill all through the 1600s, an operation that was for grinding the corn to make your flour. And a couple of vintners, because the boys needed a little pick-me-up at times. <laughs> and the other eight are miscellaneous other people, uh, minister, uh, I've forgotten all of the various ones, but they're all want singles. Uh, in 1675, we finally opened a semi-public school. The town paid part of the tuition, and the parents paid the rest. This is very late. But, whoops, sorry. Oops. Uh, in, in Salem, they opened one in 1634, right after they got here. Basically, the people that originally came in, remember, were middle class. Most of them had some education, and they wanted their children to have some education. For some reason, in Marblehead, they did not open the school very early. They got close to 1700 before they did it. Uh, in 1675, the other big event was King Philip's War, which really didn't directly affect Marblehead. And it lasted for about three years. In the, at the end of the first year, King Philip got killed, but there were still some Indian troubles after <coughs> that. Now, two Indian captives were sent to Marblehead to be shipped to the Indies as slaves. And by the way, this was a big thing, because the Puritans were against slavery. You had to really have done something bad before they made you a slave. So they were shipping them to the Indies, and some of the women with marble head, who must have been some real rough customers, literally killed them. There was a lot of concern that the Indians would reciprocate. They didn't, but uh, that kind of ended it. In 1689, uh, William III became king of England. And the trouble was, with him came a war with France. War was never good for the fishing industry. You had enough problems with storms and uh, seas and cold weather without having armed uh, warships looking for you, too. And the next year, a fellow named Phipps, who was given uh, command by the king, set up an, uh, an expedition to Acadia. And it turned out Marblehead had hired an armed cargo ship. And by the way, a lot of the ships in the cargo ships in the 1600s were armed because the English Navy was not what it was in the 1700s and 1800s. They had to protect their <coughs> own. And it was going to carry their fish to England to pay their debts. And he requisitioned it. Now, no one knows whether he got the ship or not, but it says that Marblehead was paying for the debts in England with fish. Uh, as far as the Salem witch trials, I won't go into much there. That's more than enough been said, except to say, the Mammy Red, her real name was Reed in today's R-E-A-D or R-E-E-D, depending. They, they spelled it either way in those times. She was the wife of a Samuel Reed. She was at worst, she wasn't poor because she had a servant girl. Samuel was a fisherman, but uh, he didn't, uh, he was not poor. He died with a pretty good estate. In any case, the worst you can say about her was she was a sharp-tongued woman who made enemies. There's lots of men and women around. 
who like that, and they don't get executed for it. So <laughs> she was one of the poor souls. On Marblehead Church, in 1638, William Walton appeared in town. Now, he wasn't your itinerant preacher. He was a class, called his classmate of John Howard. He was a class A minister. And they built a church for him, probably closer to 1648 than 1638. And he ran a ministry that was in line with the beliefs of the Marbleheads. It was a more tolerant ministry than the Puritans ran. He was paid out of the town taxes and was about half of it. And he served his congregation until 1668, which is 30 years. He was one of several long live ministers the town had. They got a Harvard educated Reverend Samuel Cheever, who was about 29 at the time, to replace him. What had happened over time, though, was the Puritan church didn't remain a really strict Calvinist affair. One of its problems was, as their children grew up, they all grown up in the church. The only church they knew was the Puritan church. To be a member of the Puritan church by the original requirements, you had to be a convert. Well, you couldn't convert from a church that you were already in, so they had to ease off and the requirements, and bit by bit, the church moderated the point where Marblehead residents became joined. There were about, by 1684, there were 54 residents of Marblehead who were members. And the interesting thing, there were 15 men and 39 women. Women had a pretty good place under the Puritans. They were very strict in religion. But they allowed women a lot of rights. Women could own land as long as they had the means. In a few cases, they could vote. They uh, could be full members of the church, which was a big thing at the time. So this was not the poor, downtrodden woman that the suffragettes called. And this, this kind of history stayed with Massachusetts. If you look at Massachusetts, laws for women. They tend to be pretty uh, liberal compared to many other parts of the colony that became states. All, they all went back to the Puritan uh, heritage. Well, all these people had to go to Salem to receive the sacrament. So they requested in 1684 that Reverend Cheever be ordained, and they had a big ceremony. And on the 16th of July, July he was ordained. So Marblehead now had an official church. Uh, this official church, and I think the last edition was made in something like 1674, and they finally outgrew it. So in 1695, they built a church on Franklin Street, on roughly the corner of Orn and Franklin, and decommissioned the church on the old hill, and it probably was taken down for various purposes. No one ever said what happened to it. Now, the other big event in 1684 is the Marblehead Deed. And this goes to what happened in England. In 1660, after the Cromwell Protectorate, <coughs> Charles II, who was a steward, uh, ascended the English throne. And he saw that Massachusetts Bay was pretty well running its own show. It was close to a Commonwealth state than a colony. The colony was supposed to feed all <coughs> its monies back to England. They were, but indirectly, to merchants. But it wasn't going to the government. So he tried to do something about it. He introduced navigation laws. He tried other measures. No, he couldn't enforce any of them because he didn't have the money to go bring ships and men over here, which is what it was going to take to do. <coughs> so finally, he made a threat in the early 1680s to revoke the Mass Bay Colony Chart. Now this was a very big thing because the authority for the land ownership 
for virtually every town except the few that had gotten an Indian deed was that charter. If it's revoked, the king had the choice of reassigning the land and having you buy it a second time or assigning it to somebody else. Now, since mo actual hard money was virtually un unobtainable in that period, everybody's wealth was in his land and his house. No, that was going to be close to a revolution if you ever took away a man's house and his land. So every community around here started to look around for an appropriate Indian who could uh, <laughs> get him a deed that might stand up in court. And Marvel had formed a committee to investigate the land claims and found a group of Indians that fit the bill and cut a deed and portioned the cost out to the landowners, and it wasn't too much. And that's where the Ravelhead deed come, came from. Now, in 1684, Charles did revoke the charter. However, soon after, he died. And his successor, James II, who had converted to Roman Catholicism, he was in no position to do very much of anything. He was, he was battling just to hold on to his kingship, which he only did for four years before William III, who was William of Orange, came over and pushed him out. So the result was nothing happened out of this. The new charter was issued in 1692, and that ended the affair, except when they opened up a registry of deeds in Salem in 1704, Everybody rushed over there with their deed to make sure it got registered, hoping this would get legality. But the fact that there had been a threat to their land for 20 years or hanging over their heads was something they hadn't forgotten. And they immediately got all those deeds, which is why we know so much about really the mid-1600s, is they took those deeds over to Salem to make sure that they uh, got properly accounted for. And this is the deed which is on display at Abbott Hall. And its text is available on the line. It's very hard to read. That kind of ends the marble head of the 1600s. This is kind of a picture of Sydney. If this is a picture <coughs> of six maps that Sidney Pearlie put together, which are reasonably okay. There are certainly some errors in here. The church, for instance, hasn't moved to Franklin Street, and clearly it had at that point. But it's the best we've got, and people can take it for at least a start at point as to where things were in 1700. This is the Marblehead side, and the Salem side, had not changed a lot except that it extended down towards Peach's Point. So by 1700, Marblehead was a mature community of over a thousand inhabitants. And I've seen numbers between a thousand and fifteen hundred, depending on who you look at. The cash economy was based on fishing. And the people looked to have a reasonably comfortable life by the standards of those times. Nothing we'd be comfortable with. But certainly they were dying with 100 and 200 pound estates. They were living a not bad life. And Rattlehead, I'd say, was now ready for what had to be the, one of the great expansions. By 1760, it was the second largest and most important town in the entire colony. And that's really the, what happened in the early 1700s. Marblehead was an absolute boom town from about 1730 to 1760. They were making money hand over fist. But that's for a later story. <laughs>